Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. The Poisonwood Bible is a fiction novel by author Barbara Kingsolver about a missionary family who moved from the U.S. state of Georgia to the Congo in 1959. It's a story about being an incarnational missionary. In other words, a foreign missionary trying to to live like the locals, and coming up short in so many ways. Now, it's a goal for any ambassador to familiarize himself with local customs, food, language, so on. So also, that is a noble goal for any ambassador of Christ, to know the people whom you are serving well, but in some situations it is impossible to cross over to the other side of the culture gap. Now let me just give you an example of what I'm talking about. Now I have a bad back. I threw it out about 15 years ago, and every once in a while it acts up, especially when I'm carrying something heavy in my hands. So when I see here in Africa people carrying large items on their heads, it makes a lot of sense. However, if I were to walk into a grocery store carrying a crate of empty bottles on my head, then I think that people would take offense think that I was mocking them. You know, in some circumstances, even trying to speak the local language is offensive. In government offices, English is the official tongue. So I think the best that you can hope for as an incarnational missionary is to meet in the middle of the bridge. Nobody expects me to live like a local, not my church body that sent me, and certainly not the locals that I serve. If anybody puts that burden on me, it's it's me, myself. Now, we American missionaries living in Africa have a fairly sheltered existence. We are isolated from the day-to-day kind of hardships that most of our brothers and sisters here face. Like, for example, how people will walk for miles to get water from a pump and then carry it back home. Or how so many people here cook their meal over wood fires. Malawian citizens who are uh, of a Caucasian racial makeup and expats who live in this country exist in a parallel universe, I would say, with a completely different standard of living, visiting different restaurants, shopping at different places from the average Malawian. Uh, Yes, you will see some native Africans at these places, obviously, otherwise they would probably go out of business. But those Africans are also living in the parallel universe. They have adopted Western culture and norms. They are the top 1% of their country. I enjoy a very different standard of life than the average Malawian. And 
Honestly, it's not pleasant to think about the inequities. And I can't hide here behind my compound's walls because every day there are locals who are coming onto the grounds to work, either to wash my clothes or to take care of the grounds. Like something out of the antebellum south, there's a servant quarters where some of the staff lives. It's really little more than a shack. The workers help me bring in the groceries from my car, and then they cook their simple meals over a fire. I drive a car. And they use a bicycle or walk. And no matter how much I try to rationalize this situation by saying to myself that they're lucky to have steady employment or to tell myself that they don't really expect to live an American lifestyle, I know full well that the money doesn't go very far. It's because I hear them talking about it. Oh, these people are not scenery. They're not machines. They're flesh and blood people who love their families. They get tired and sick. They worship the same God that I do. In the New Testament book of First Thessalonians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes, You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Now, we American expats don't experience the same kind of suffering that Paul and his companions faced in the first century. I have not been beaten or imprisoned here in Malawi or anywhere else for that matter. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not looking for martyrdom, but I have to wonder how effective of a witness can I be when I am surrounded by the comforts of Western life. How can I model hospitality to others when I am reluctant to open my home to my Malawian brothers and reveal the painfully obvious differences in our standard of living? And perhaps they are intimidated as well. I don't expect my Malawian friends to understand how much I've sacrificed to come here. I don't expect sympathy that I downsized from a 2,600 square foot house to a place that's less than half its size. Or that I went from three cars to only one car when I know where my Malawian friends live and how they get around from place to place. I don't expect my Malawian brothers to feel sorry for me because I can't just jump in a car and drive to see my parents or my kids for the holidays. I know that there are Malawians that can't afford to travel to the other side of town to see their kids. Uh, it's hard enough for members of my own family back in the United States to wrap their heads around the sacrifices we've made for the sake of this ministry. How could I expect local Malawians to, to know any different? Well, what can I learn from Paul, the apostle, today? He said, We lived among you for your sake. Paul not only endured the hardships of missionary life, 
he lived among the Thessalonians and interacted with them for their sake. It's not about uh, me fulfilling some need to be uh, the ideal missionary, to reach my targets, to achieve my goals, to turn my dreams into reality. It should be about my brothers. And Paul writes, you became imitators of us. So Paul didn't segregate himself from the Thessalonians. He didn't try to hide uh, the way he lived from them. Instead, he let them see his struggles. He let them see his joys. He was transparent with them. He let them see his life so that they would become imitators of him. He wrote, You welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering. See, the message is what's paramount, not the planning or the products, the books, or the curriculum. And in spite of Paul's hardships and the hardships of new converts to Christianity, he says that they were filled with joy given by the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't cheer them up with his presence. Paul didn't give them their strength to carry on because he was suffering in silence alongside of them. No, it was God working through the message of Christ's acceptance of sinners from every corner of the world. That's what filled those Thessalonians with joy and enabled them to endure their hardships. I am not Malawi's savior. And that takes a big burden off my shoulders. I'll never be able to relate to Africans the way that Christ does. Now, he was from heaven, yet he humbled himself and entered our human existence perfectly. He lived among us so that we may live with him in heaven and be at peace with each other here on earth. Christ's life was obvious to all. He didn't hide anything. And we are to become his imitators, first and foremost, whether you live in the United States or any other country in the world. Christ's message fills us with joy that no Facebook post or birthday wish could ever come close to evoking. So, as I make forays into the local culture here, I dip my fingers into the Nsema and consider myself adaptable. But deep down in my heart, I know that I can only go so far across that cultural bridge. I can't change who I am. But with God's help, I can lower some of the barriers that history, race, and culture have erected between me and my neighbor. God is helping my wife and me deal with both the blessings and the burdens of living in a foreign country. Because God's Son endured much greater hardships, there's no need for guilt. Rather, I'm thankful to be put to use for the good of God's kingdom. Now, next time on Home Ties, U.S. citizens living abroad enjoy certain privileges like having easy access to the U.S. consulate and receiving assistance with some kinds of emergencies. 
But being a U.S. citizen does not give you diplomatic immunity from the laws of your host country. And sometimes you can find yourself in a very awkward position. We'll see you next time.